So I am currently acting as the director of growth marketing at No Commerce, which is super fun. I'm like, I'm learning a ton, man, really fast. Just really right into the fire. Yes, I, I started primarily on the brand side. So I've been an operator for a really long time. I've I've never been a brand founder, mostly because I've been an operator long enough to be like, I don't think I'd ever want to be a founder. <laughs> like those poor founders, man, they got some work. They're just so in it all day long. So I've done media buying. I've been on the email side. I've done SMS. I've done landing pages and sales funnels. Like I've done kind of across the board. But I started in media buying about four years ago and then just randomly found myself here, <laughs> which is awesome. And yeah, no commerce was kind enough to like give me a job this year, which was very nice of them. That's awesome. I had yeah. uh, Andrew Foxwell on recently and I found out, I didn't know he was one of the original founders or co-founders. Yeah. Yeah. He, I think he's an investor as far as I know. Okay. And just a lovely human. I love Andrew. Yeah, he's such super a, he's nice. Such a great guy. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So you're doing growth marketing there. Yes. Which means I have, I wear a lot of hats. <laughs> I, uh, the growth marketing, like, role, I would say, owns a ton of different pieces of the actual marketing like funnel. Mm -hmm. And it's just, sometimes it gets very intense because you have to, to be in this role, you have to really love chaos, I think, because <laughs> you're just doing so many different things on a daily basis. So I'm in charge of all of our social stuff, but also all of our sales funnels and all of our positioning, all of our copy and our messaging and understanding customers and doing customer research. I love it because I'm like, I just thrive on chaos. Um, but it's been interesting. It's been a really cool role to kind of fall into. So, yeah. And I know that uh, customer behavior or, or customer insights and psychology is really your sweet spot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this was a, a really good fit for me just because it, no commerce is all about customer data, information, just finding out behaviors and why people purchase and all, all kinds of different information that I think most brands don't have. Uh, mostly because they just don't have time to sit down with a customer for 30 minutes and, you know, do that multiple times and, and continue doing it throughout the year. That's very hard to do. It's a lot of work to get that done. So this one was a great fit for me because psychology, consumer behavior, like mm -hmm. economics, that kind of behavioral science is just really interesting. And I've been studying it for about 10 years. So it's just good fit, really right time, right place, I think. <clears throat> and, you know, when you're talking about uh, consumer psychology or behavior, I can see what you're saying. Like a lot of brands, it can be a gray area uh, or yeah. a foreign area. Like, do we need to know about Freud? Do we need to know this or that? Right? So, uh, I mean, just kind of frame it for me. Like, where are you at when it comes to mindset for consumer behavior, consumer psychology? Yeah. I One of the things that I find most interesting about the disconnect between DTC brands and consumer behavior, consumer psychology is the fact that there's quite a lot of people in this space that have studied psychology um, or some form of it, uh, communications, those type of things, but they don't know how to apply it. And that's something that colleges, I think, don't do a very good job on. <laughs> Even if you have an MBA, like they don't teach you how to apply those mm. concepts. They just teach you what they are. So I was lucky enough that I didn't go through the college roster. So I didn't really have what I would term as like, negative habits that just kind of come out of college, which is like, oh, everything's just going to work, right? Yeah. I just apply what college taught me and it'll work. Not so. That's not at all how it works out here in the real world. So I was lucky I got firsthand experience for decades of just being deep into the funnels and understanding why isn't this landing page working and why isn't the conversions going right. So the disconnect between the two, I think, stems from the fact that we have knowledge of it. We just don't know how to apply it. So I was lucky enough that I started my career on Twitter. Um, and honestly, I just got on there because I wanted more friends. <laughs> it was the pandemic. And I was like, I'm very lonely. I'm at home with two kids. Like, I just don't see any of like my marketing cohort very often. So I just need friends. So I got on Twitter and started following the greats, like Cody from Jones Road and Nick Shackelford and like all of the big players and just kind of got to know the industry and started making friends. And then I started randomly sharing at the end of 2021, I want to say. Just insights about here's how you could apply psychology to your ads. And it just exploded. <laughs> I didn't realize that I was going to be the only person in the room talking about it. I thought I was going to show up late to the party. But yeah, it's, it's been fun to share because large disconnect, I think. Well, I guess I'm happy to share with you. I'm a college dropout, so I won't have yes, that. You and me. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, one year we did it. Uh, college in the mountains. Um <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, you know, 
before we go into the applying it, because it sounds like that's going to be a big part of this talk, let's just talk about finding it, right? Well, mm -hmm. what what tools are you using? Like what um, resources, channels are you using to find consumer insights? Yeah. So I have a couple different ways that I do this. I started out like early generalized marketing in my early 20s, doing it the old fashioned way, which is just reading, right? We would go and we would just read all of our comments, read all the reviews, read all the social media posts, get on Reddit, those type of things. Those are still some of the best places to find information because they are unsolicited, right? So like nobody's paying those people to say those things. They're it's giving this information for free and very unfiltered. Yes, especially on Reddit. You can get some massively amazing stories coming off of there that are so raw <laughs> and real and people get very like charismatic with how they share their things. So um, still one of the best places I think to go find information, especially if you're trying to understand what your customers know about a particular industry or problem. That unfortunately though, requires a lot of time. So mm -hmm. unless you have somebody dedicated to that role that you're just gonna be understanding our customers for us, it's very hard to get that much information out of it. So the next place I would go, um, for me at least, is linguistic analysis. So I have, all of last year, I was basically consulting for brands, taking all of their reviews down from their websites, and then categorizing them into nine different emotional motivators that we were using to understand the emotional aspect of the actual purchase itself. So I wasn't really looking for like what age they are, like, you know, how old, how old their family is, like how much money do you make? I was looking for what made you purchase from an emotional standpoint. That takes a lot of effort too, though, because I still haven't found a good automated way to do this. I've been using chat and trying to get that to work mm -hmm. for me and it hasn't really worked out that well. I'm still trying to get that one to be as accurate as I want it to be. So overall, you have to do that by hand. Like you have to go down and categorize each and every review by itself based upon the language that people are using. It's very effective, but it takes a long time. So outside of that, though, I think most people will kind of forget that there's other ways to get information that are very, very simple, like surveys. And it just kind of funny because all of last year, I didn't even think about post-purchase surveys. Like mm -hmm. when people ask me, what should I use to get more information? I was giving advice, yada, yada, didn't even think about post-purchase surveys until no commerce approached me early this year and said, do you, I mean, we have a position for you. Would you like to come work for us? And I was like, oh yeah, post-purchase surveys are a thing. This, and now I'm like hooked. I can't get away from post-purchase because it's just so easy to get information and the conversion rates on it are extremely high. So way higher than like any sort of email open rates, any sort of pop-up, like our, uh, over at NoCommerce, ours, we sit at about 55% engagement rate. So that means like they're at least doing something with survey and 45% completion rate, which is massive. I mean, you're getting a ton of data off of that. Yeah. So yeah, more questions you can ask people, the better, I think, for sure. And I know you said you were looking for basically a year you were spending looking at emotional drivers. I remember... Yeah. Um, I can't remember which Seth Godin book it was, but one of his books, when I was doing nonprofit marketing years ago, uh, he had a book that said, you know, people make decisions based off of emotion and then uh, justify them based 100%. off of statistics or data, <laughs> right? Yep. Um, do you see that? And so that, I saw that in the nonprofit world. Do you see that in like e-commerce or for-profit area as well? Yes. Oh my gosh. It, and it's a little weird because human behavior is really 100% driven off of the emotions themselves because 95% of our processing power comes from the subconscious, which is the part of the brain that we can't access. Mm. So 95% of any behavior you do, like the coffee you choose, the temperature you are in the room, like whether you want to put on a coat or not, even the people that you talk to is all coming from, for me, almost 35 years of experiences, right? Of just living on the planet. The interesting part is I can to some aspect, kind of control how I feel about those emotions because I have a conscious, right? So like 5% of those decisions are coming out of the part of the brain I control. So even if I come into a room and I see somebody that I maybe don't like, <laughs> I might immediately feel like, oh gosh, I, know, I just don't want to be here. And that's coming out of the subconscious. But my logical processing will then go, maybe we should just leave, right? <laughs> so you have an emotional decision that is justified by your logical processing. It's like the weirdest thing ever. The brain is fascinating. 
Yeah, it's um, you know, I was thinking before this call of questions I could ask, and I had the thought I was like, you know, can I spend money to go to therapy biweekly just to learn my own brain? And we're going to talk about how we try to figure out other people's brains as well. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so hard because a lot of us are struggling with some very long, long developed problems, right? Like that stem from yeah. childhood and teen years of like issues that we had during that formative time where we just didn't feel comfortable or we don't feel accepted, and then we just carry it with us. Especially if you don't go to therapy in your teen years or early 20s and you don't try and figure out why those things are happening to you, it's very hard to to unlatch yourself from them as you get to be an adult. And this is something that I talk about. I feel like I need to talk about this more. Per, like parenting comes into play heavily with what you purchase, how much you purchase, when you purchase it, what types of things you purchase. It's insane. Awesome. So they've done a few studies on this of how like, parental purchases actually affect the children, right? So like your kids will have an influence on you as a parent, but it's vice versa as well. So they're starting to do studies now about generationally, the parents that you had and the type of parenting that they chose to utilize, such as like helicopter parenting, attachment mm -hmm. parenting. In the 80s, it was all about kind of like detached parents, right? Which was not their fault. It was just the generation that they grew up in depending on which one you had above you, it's going to affect not only how you feel about yourself as a person, but your worldview. Mm -hmm. So it'll start to come into play when you purchase things that specifically you want to try and fill that hole of whatever you kind of experienced as a child and your parents between the ages of about one and seven, very formative years. So for me, I mean, I had, I had parents that were both working parents. So like they were lovely. They were very attentive when they were home, but like they worked a lot because they just had mm -hmm. to, right? Like we didn't grow up with a ton of money. So it was just my brother and I constantly with each other all the time. And my parents were just always working. That's the only thing I saw from them was work, work, work. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, now that I'm an adult, <laughs> all I do is work because that was the example that I had set between those years. It also, though, I mean, very, very much, and obviously this is anecdotal information, like you'd have to look up the studies to get this global view. But for me, my parents were frugal. It was like, we're not going to go out. We're not going to purchase things. Like the only thing we ever splurged on was food. So like we went to McDonald's maybe once or twice a month and it was like a big deal, right? We went mm -hmm. to ice cream once a week and it was a big deal. So now that I'm an adult, those are the things that I crave a lot is the experiences with my kids around ice cream and McDonald's, which is like mind boggling. Cause like I'm an adult and like, I have a job, we make a decent amount of money. Like I don't have to have that. Right. But it's just, it's so deep in there. I can't get rid of it. And this is what we have to understand about humans in general is like the entirety of their adult person was built between the years of one and 18. It's hmm. crazy stuff. My mind's just swirling with uh, side questions here, but I'll, I'll <laughs> go with the main one that I had, which was, you know, you called out, um, you called out the opportunity for learning how to apply all of mm -hmm. this stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the information you're sharing with me on um, parents buying decisions could affect children. Like when I hear that, I think it makes a lot of sense. P and G can keep up with that. Like yeah. you know, Procter and Gamble can <laughs> yeah. have data tables and all that for it, but you know, can a, $3 million a year e-commerce business, like apply that. What, where would you say we need to start at with our conversation on just figuring out how to apply all this information? Yeah. yeah. Application is one of the biggest questions I get, and it's almost always to paid advertising. Mm -hmm. um, and that's mostly because that's my specialty. Uh, in general, though, I would say you have to understand how the data relates to each other. And this is tough, I think, for any brand, especially in the DTC industry. E-com is one of the spaces where we are bootstrapped. We come from very modest means, most of us, right? A lot of us didn't go to college. A lot of us don't have that kind of like formal education. So we had mm -hmm. to teach ourselves a lot of how to do this, which also means that not a whole lot of us have training as a data analyst. Mm. And that's hard <laughs> because all of these brand founders just deserve so much success. I, I see them every day and I talk to them all week long and they just deserve the world because they have tried so hard, many of them multiple, multiple times to try and be successful at this and create a business that they can not only use to change the world, but to change their own family. So like you guys props to all the brand founders out there. Um, in general though, they just don't have enough training on how to read the data. So the very first thing I would do is find someone who can teach you how to read it. Um, whether that's, you know, following any economists on podcasts or on YouTube or wherever it is, that's the best place to learn. 
or do what I did and just go to the library and start picking up books of like, how do I read this data? Once you understand what the data says, then you can start to apply it to whatever you want it to apply to. The nice part about consumer behavior data is that it's not just for paid advertising. You can use it for product development. You can use it to inform your CX team. You can use it for landing page success. Like as soon as we understand what the consumers want and what they desire, so much easier to build everything else. We're not guessing anymore. Yeah. That's, so what would you say crosses the threshold of um, one-off complaint or like, you know, one idea to like, oh, this is actually something I need to pay attention to. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That's where it helps to get like actual data on it. And this is where obviously I work for no commerce, but like post purchase surveys <laughs> are one of the best ways to do this because it'll give you a number. I need the numbers. Too many brands I think are working off of anecdotal evidence where, well, I, I read a lot of our reviews and they, they all say this, and mm -hmm. then I'll ask them, okay, what was the frequency percentage of that? And they can't give me those numbers because they were like, well, I don't know. I just, I just read a lot and a lot of them said it. Not quite accurate enough for me. I don't like to make marketing decisions based upon guesses or anecdotal feelings because it's very possible that on the day you were reading this, that's just what your brain pulled out. Wanted to see. Exactly. It's possible it's not accurate. So I need the numbers. If you're not going to do it through post-purchase surveys, I need to get into Shopify. Give me the actual hard, cold data of like, here's our AOV. Here's all of the purchases that we've had. Here's all of the data that we have on these people. Put it into a spreadsheet and start making some connections. Have to have that numerical data. It's too important to miss. Well, and let's talk about KPIs. I heard you say, um, what was it? Frequency ratio yeah. for yeah. Mm -hmm. any other you know buzzword or KPIs that we could chat about with that? Yeah. So on top of the frequency ratios, I always like to look at, well, and th th some of this comes from obviously straight from SaaS world, but mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out exactly what the AOV ratio is to the actual like question that was asked in particular, especially when it comes to consumer behavior data. So on the back end of, of most of these survey platforms nowadays, it'll ask the question of like, where did you first hear about us? And then we can check and see what the revenue and the like actual AOV off of that question was. Mm -hmm. So I can understand, like after we get this question, how much money is actually being contributed or like attributed to that particular question. It's pretty important to understand relationships and data analysis. And the only reason I know this is because my brother works uh, for MyFitnessPal and he's a data analyst and he's awesome. Um, and he, like every time... He talks about his job. I'm like, we need more of what you do <laughs> in this industry because nobody understands the relationships between the data. I've had large brands come and give me these like 200 page, just massive reports from big data analyst companies that are using more projection style kind of software. I was say, did they have, did they have insights yes. or was it just findings? It was more what I would say projections. It was just like, okay. we think this okay. is what's happening. Which drives me a little crazy because I'm like, this is 200 pages and I know you paid a yeah. lot of money for this, but I can't use it. I literally cannot use this. Mm -hmm. Whereas with something like a survey or even a quiz, like if you're using any sort of quiz on your website, that data is almost more actionable for me because then I can ask questions to get an answer. And that goes a little bit deep into like inquiry theory of how do you ask a question to get a particular data set answer? But that, I mean, that we could, that's a whole nother topic, but yes. It's just, you got to understand how the relationships are made before you can make decisions. And so I'm curious, and outside of just telling chat GPT to act like a consumer <laughs> behavior expert and to create a course on how to learn that, do you have any books uh, or resources you would suggest for someone wanting to start learning this? Oh my gosh, I wish. I feel bad because I'm like, you guys need to learn this. And then there's just nothing. There's There's not a whole lot out there, save for like, just listening to a lot of podcasts, getting on mm. YouTube and like typing in, how do I understand my data? Those type of things. I learned it just because I've looked at a lot of data and I've read a lot of economics books and I kind of understand like how those relationships are made. Yeah. But without doing quite a lot of research, it's very difficult, I think, for the brand founders to do it. That's why I suggest quickest way is to find someone who knows how to do it. Mm. So there's plenty of data analysts that you can hire off of different places just to come look at your data that I think would be very, very beneficial. Awesome. And chat GPT always out there too. <laughs> yes. They say it has the answers. Um, 
Awesome. Well, I know you were talking about integrating it in and you said uh, Facebook ads is the most commonly asked question. You say probably because that's where you specialize in. Um, but what other areas? I mean, you say product development, you know, yeah. marketing channels, website, I'm sure. Wh where are we looking at integrating? Yes. One of the best ones that I ever saw was actually a global um, fix for a brand. And when I say global, I'm talking more like brand strategy. We had a brand that actually had somebody, a data analyst company, go and analyze the majority of their credit card purchases, mostly because they were trying to discover who is our audience, like who who's actually using their credit card to purchase on our website. And they found it was usually moms somewhere between the age of like 45 and 55, right? So pretty much targeted to what they thought was going to be their target audience. They came back, uploaded a survey just to see if that data was accurate and actually found out that it was the teenage daughters of these moms that was using their mom's credit card to purchase these products. So it was like, can you imagine if they had used all of their marketing like budget to try and get moms in the door when it was actually the teenage daughters that were purchasing? So yeah. if you understand the data, if you can look at the data and say, oh, I get it, this applies to this and this is how this kind of works together, you can start building a brand that's just way easier. And I think that's why I'm so big on getting customer data as much as you possibly can. It's because it's just easier. It's like easy button for brands because you can't do it by guessing. It's going to take you years to test and test and test to see which message is going to hit best. And then consumers are going to change because they do about every 12 weeks. As soon as we get into a new season, as soon as we get into a new time of year, all of their behaviors shift. So like, it's just hard. It's too hard without the data to do it just blindly, basically. And you said they change every 12 weeks. That's uh, interesting you say that because, you know, we work with startups at my agency. We work with uh, corporations and uh, sometimes we'll hear startups with the mindset of like, we just need to figure out our audience and figure out the messaging and then like, let's <laughs> yeah. just continue forward. And one thing I tell them is, you know, we have calls with billion dollar companies and they're in the same boat. They're trying to yeah. figure out their messaging. Like, does it ever end? And I mean, how do you go about um, kind of setting a routine or rotation for that? Yes. Oh, that's such a good question because this goes down into a couple different things. Herd mentality is very big for humans. We follow anybody that sounds like they know what they're talking about, which is not bad. Um, it's a protective mechanism, but it also makes it so that the majority of marketing like tips and tricks or even hacks end up circulating, right? So you'll start to see the same tricks come back around every single year. People start talking, well, like UGC is working again, or like statics are working again. Statics and it's, back. Yeah. Yes, statics are back. And it's really interesting because in general, <laughs> that information is basically just being regurgitated. As soon as one person says it, then four people will say it, then four more people will say it. And it just multiplies mm -hmm. over time. It doesn't mean the necessarily that the information isn't accurate, but a lot of times it is inaccurate. <laughs> so when we talk about trying to build strategies for the purchasing behavior time period that people are in, we also have to go back, back down to basics. Like what makes up a person? Why would anybody buy any purchase ever? Like what's the, what's the purpose of buying a product, right? And then we'll go into industry data of what's the purpose of buying your product. Why would anybody buy a water bottle? Like just out of the functional side of it, like I could also use just a coffee cup, right? Why can't I use a coffee cup to carry my water? Why would I use a water bottle? So we have to understand like the actual use cases for the products before we can build out strategies into them. And then we need to understand, okay, what's happening during the year? Oftentimes, especially in the US, we follow holidays pretty quickly, like very solidly for our behavior. So you'll notice that big box stores will start to bring out Halloween decorations somewhere in like August. <laughs> which is ridiculous. We all think all the consumers are like, why would you do that? Like, it's not Halloween yet. This is ridiculous. But they're doing it on purpose because they're preemptively priming you to purchase in about six weeks, right? Mm. So this is where it gets a little bit more difficult for the DDC brands because all of our storefronts are online. We can't bring our product out on a shelf six weeks ahead of time, but we can prime people. And priming goes deep into like, basically suggesting that you're going to do something in a particular period of time by reminding you that it exists way ahead of time. So yeah, some of this is, is a lot of like deep seated psychology. Uh, but a lot of it really is just understanding how humans work. Yeah. 
No, that makes sense. And I know one other area that you like to um, chat about or work in is generational marketing as well. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> I love generational marketing. I don't think we talk about it enough and I don't think people understand the generations outside of their own generation very much. So it's fun to talk about for sure. Yeah. And, and just to make sure we have the same mindset before I ask you questions about it, generational marketing, um, I guess, tell me your definition of it or your focus on it. Yes. So generational marketing has to do with creating strategies that are targeted towards the age and demographic of the person that you are trying to sell to. And that's a little counterintuitive to what Sarah says all the time, which is like, you should be marketing to the emotions, not necessarily the age of the person. But that's probably the only data set, the non-emotional data set that I keep track of is age, because that really does change. Like we talked about in you know, parenting models and things like that, it changes how you see the world and how you purchase things. Yeah. And so we're, we're in the process of doing a go-to-market strategy for a company. And um, we were looking at uh, generational opportunities and saw that, you know, Adidas just rolled out their first new line in like over 50 years. Yeah. I saw Mm -hmm. that. I was like, Whoa, that's a big deal. (laughs) Yeah. And there was a a report that was talking about uh, the money moving from baby boomer to Gen Z and millennial. I can't remember what it was. It was many of billions of dollars. Yeah. Um, are you seeing brands really starting to kind of follow the herd or pick up the trend of moving towards the younger demographics or generations? This is a really interesting one because we have to understand that like the culture affects the people, right? And how you build culture is through language. So this goes into a little bit of linguistic analysis, but in general, when you talk about the different generations, all of them heard something different growing up because they all went through very interesting political landscapes and economic landscapes. They, experienced very different volatile times. In general, again, generalization for all of this, but in general, the baby boomer generation has the majority of the wealth in this country. They are also just about to retire indefinitely. So a lot of them actually own the majority of the businesses that reside in the country. um, And a lot of them actually own brick and mortar style businesses. Now, when they go to retire, none of them will have anybody to purchase those businesses because the generation below them, which is like Gen X millennial, don't have the desire to own those type of businesses, nor do they have the money to purchase them. So we're about to have a large amount of people, baby boomers, who are about to come into a large amount of cash (laughs) and know where to put it, which is very difficult. So if you're a business or a brand, uh, understanding generational marketing is going to be very important for you, especially in the next like five-ish years, five to seven years. Because once the baby boomers start moving out of the economic landscape of owning small businesses, they will now have large amounts of money that they just have nothing to do with. Um, And that's obviously not every baby boomer. That's a very particular subgroup of them. But outside of the baby boomers, Gen X and millennials have a very different worldview of what they're supposed to be doing with their money, right? A lot of them aren't having kids. And a lot of them are choosing to not have children, which totally fine. It just changes the landscape. If we don't have babies coming in, we also don't have people who need diapers. We don't have people who need baby wraps. We don't have people who need toys. We also don't have people who need, in general, copious amounts of food or lots of different clothing. Like the cultural landscape changes everything about how the businesses in this country will see success. If you're in the parent industry, you're about to see a large upset within the next five to 10 years because we don't have parents coming in. So yes, understanding where the generation sit is like pivotal for brands. Yeah, that unlocked a lot for me. I hadn't looked at it that way, honestly. (laughs) Um, But I do have a follow-up question, which is, you know, as we're looking at generational marketing and you're looking at pivoting your marketing to maybe mm-hmm. um, Gen Z or a different, personally, I see it in two directions, which is, I mean, it comes with your messaging, which I'd like to ask, does messaging come first or does creative come first? Do you think messaging before creative or vice versa? Creative always. Images always before text. Yep. yep. Okay. And um, with that, you know, I feel like your messaging strategy can be part of this, like your overall you know, copy, what you're saying, but also just the style of your creative, like just the look of it, the style, the format. Um, I don't know if I really have a question from this. I guess I was just want to say, <laughs> do you see that? And I mean, yes. are you working with anything like that? 
Yeah. So anytime we, we start to talk about like paid advertising and how we should formulate ad design and layout, um, performance ad design is very different than any other design I've ever seen and should be, honestly, um, because of how the platform psychology works. So the platform's are obviously every single one has its own kind of like psychology to it of how it's formulated. The UX of them really dictate how people feel about what's on them. So in general, I always start with the images first because the brain will process images 60,000 times faster than text. And so the ability for it to recognize and understand that this is something I, I need to stop at because it's important to me is just faster for images. This is often why people try and prioritize video, but that's not entirely how that works. Um, oftentimes the brain will stop at a video because of the sound, not because of the actual image. Uh, and this is, TikTok is heavily into this. If you have a good sound on TikTok, you have a, a much better chance of someone stopping than if you have a good video. Uh, sound is, is everything. Outside of that though, the message is like core to what is going to get people to stay. The image gets them to stop. The text and the actual message gets them to stay. And this is where building in the emotional motivators into your copy is, is one of the best ways to get people to actually co to convert because it's, it's all about the emotions that they're feeling subconsciously like we talked about. So it's really important to get those two things right. And uh, one last question for you that kind of just popped up. Um, you know, when you're looking at doing creative strategy for a business, I see top down and bottom up. And I'll explain those. So top down would be, you know, you take their brand guide, you take their USPs, their core values, and then you come up with a whole, you know, uh, three to four, four to five messaging strategies or messaging categories that you want to use for that channel. And then that feeds into your ad copy and your creative or bottom up, which is we're in a hurry. I'm the client. We're in a hurry. <laughs> Find what's performed well in the past, do some creative yeah. trends and create some things. Um, which do you prefer, which do you like, you know, work with and have you seen success with either more than the other? Yeah. For the media buyers, I've noticed they get pushed into both. Most of the media buyers, creative strategists, anybody in that field usually is required to do both where it's like, mm -hmm. we need you to build us a really good solid strategy. And can you get us like, you know, Quick X wins. number of dollars in sales in the next two days? Mm -hmm. <laughs> The toughest part for that particular person is strategy takes time and it's, it requires a very specific set of skills uh, that, that takes a long time to develop. Quick wins are a little bit easier, but they don't last as long, right? So I can probably get you quick wins, you know, within the next two weeks, but that's not longevity. And I mean, if we're going to go into brand strategy, you should never build your, your entirety of your revenue stream off of paid advertising. That's just a great way to kill the business in general. Um, I like to see somewhere between 20 and 30% coming from marketing and the rest of it coming from brand itself, which is we need, you, you need to have a position. You got to have something that sets you apart from everybody else or relates you to a particular anchor that somebody already has from your industry. Cars do this really well. So the automobile business is probably one of the best examples because there's like millions of different car providers and each car provider has like what a set of 50 different cars that they make. But I couldn't tell you the cars that Chevy like produces or the ones that Ford does. I could probably tell you three or four of them, but I don't know the rest of them. And that goes to show you these massive, massive brands that came out of nothing didn't build the, the entirety of their brand off of advertising. They did it off of brand itself. So having I know that segue, but like having a long form strategy and a short term game strategy is very important. You've got to have both to do it well. Mixed together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Well, look, we close every episode with some um, rapid fire questions. So we'll go through those. You know, if you had to summarize everything we discussed into a marketing mindset, I hate to make you simplify yeah, it that yeah. much, but if you had to <laughs> put it down to a marketing mindset, what mindset should marketers and or business owners have to implement uh, using consumer psychology? Oh my gosh, this is a really good question. This is basically like, how do you summarize what you do, Sarah? Um <laughs> I would say that understanding the behavior of humans is one of the best ways to actually scale a brand. But even better than that, understanding what affects humans, what influences humans is probably one of the better ways to build a brand. And for anyone listening that is in the stage of figuring out what they'd like to do in the marketing industry, what role or roles would you say have the highest demand opportunity in the next three to five years? 
It depends on which level of brands you're going into. If you are targeting anybody in the kind of like seven to eight figure range, I would say we still need good media buyers. We still need creative strategists over there. We actually need performance designers more than anything else. If you understand how to design performance ads, you could you could have a job for decades. If you're going into the like eight to nine figure brand range, we need data analysts. We need consumer behavior analysts. We need people who understand psychology. Um, so if you have a psychology background, we just we need a whole lot more of those people in that space. And then we also need people who understand organizational training. That's going to be pretty important for anybody in the eight to nine figure range. We need somebody who can come and set up orgs like that's they're hurting over there because <laughs> there's so many people in these brands and we just have a very difficult time getting the right information to everybody. So, yeah, that's going to be a big growing field pretty soon. Love it. And tell us where can listeners connect with you, uh, learn more about you, any resources you have? Yes, I am over on Twitter. That's probably like the main place you can find me at Sarah Levenger. That's L-E-V-I-N-G-E-R. And then on LinkedIn as well, same thing, at Sarah Levenger. Um, otherwise, no commerce is probably one of the best places to go if you guys want to learn more about data analysts and like understanding your consumers, and especially the behavior side. Other than that, though, yes, Twitter, come find me, come chat with me because I could obviously talk about this stuff all day. So, <laughs> and Twitter's not dead. I know Twitter's <laughs> not dead. I'm Twitter's shocked. Not dead. Okay. I thought it would die soon, but nope. It's going awesome. strong. Sarah, <laughs> Sarah, this was a um, very enlightening conversation. I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Yes. Thank you for having me. It was lovely.